I'm Joel Berg. I will be your moderator for today's APD Town Hall on What's Up, Three Months In. How are we doing after re-emerging strong? Tonight's Town Hall is generously sponsored by DeNovo Dental. DeNovo Dental is the original maker of the chairside space maintainers and preformed matrix band systems. You can find out more at DeNovoDental.com. Keep an eye out for an email from DeNovo to get an APD Town Hall special discount. As I've mentioned before in our past town halls, I'm grateful to have been given the opportunity to see pediatric dentistry from many different perspectives over my varied career. During this pandemic crisis, I have listened, I have observed many of the such great things that my colleagues are doing to arise from this difficult situation. <clears throat> I've heard from many of you, some who I've never met, you have spoken, you have written many thoughts. I've talked to new colleagues and former ones about their personal journeys, their thoughts about what occurred and what might, should, or will occur. Each of you has taught me something along the way. Recognizing that the evidence was not always there, in fact, often it was not there at all, we made the best decisions possible and followed local and national guidelines along with the support of the APD. What we also have learned is the need for more evidence and in what areas more evidence and information is still needed. That will be discussed a little later on. At the APD pre-conference course, one of the big hits was listening to our colleague practice owners. Well, tonight they're back, three and a half months later, stronger, I believe, and with new insights. I would like to now get to our panel and also get to your questions. And we'd like you to ask questions of our panel tonight. Some have come in before and we'll take more live as we're going through this evening. We'll be with you tonight, by the way, for maximum an hour and a half, maybe less, but uh, we look forward to a very interesting conversation. We're honored to have with us tonight several pediatrics dentist practice owners. Let me introduce them to you. For those who do not submit questions in advance to our panel, just to remind you, please use the chat feature to enter your questions. We'll try to address as many as possible. We know that APD's ongoing efforts through its policy center and its safety committee have been ever present to support us and guide us during this pandemic. And now your feedback as represented by our panel tonight will help us into the future in a stronger than ever way. So let's get right to the introductions. First, returning for, from our pre-conference course panel, Drs. Ron Shu from the Vancouver, Washington area, Dr. Hakan Koyman of Baltimore, Maryland, Anthony Miles Mazawi of Atlanta, Georgia, Jonathan Lee of Foster City, California, and joining the panel in addition tonight for the first time, Dr. Jeff Rhodes of Rogers, Arkansas. So panelists, thank you so much for being here tonight. I've been talking to you guys uh, for a while and uh, we, we talked a little bit before tonight's program. Man, there's so much to talk about. We could just pick one of the many topics that I know we're interested in and talk all night about that. But uh, we're gonna cover many topics. So let's, let's get right to it. So I wanna start out by just a check-in a few seconds from each of you, how you're doing. We've had some difficult times and you know, a lot of anxiety. Um, we, I did a podcast and then we did a town hall on how we're doing on wellness, on our own well-being. <clears throat> this has been really difficult for us and our teams, <clears throat> and, but you've done really well in the midst of that. So um, <clears throat> Jonathan, uh, you reminded me of a, of a work by Bruce Tuckman, 1965, he talked about sort of the group dynamics and how people arise from occasions and move forward as a team and talked about those group dynamics in various stages such as forming, storming, norming, and performing. So with that in mind, I'm gonna start with you, uh, Ron Shu. I'll start, no, I'll start with you, Jonathan, since you brought it up. Yeah. Are you, are you forming, storming, norming, or performing? How you doing? So uh, in the beginning, when the group got together, it was like startup mode, exciting. We were formed in there. And then we kind of went through that storming phase where we got you know, through some tough issues, like personalities, concerns. Um, and now we're at, the, we're at the norming phase at the cusp of getting to the performing stage, which means you know, most, most groups work at the norming age. The performing age, that's like the, uh, the next level. So we're right at the cusp of norming to performing. Great. I think that's a good take on it. So, Ron, let's go to you. Well, I, I think my team went from uh, from forming um, and to 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 
to try to storm and perform. I don't know if we had Norm in there anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. But, but, it's been a work uh, in progress the whole way. Yeah. Yeah. And and but the the surprise is that you know we 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 not only uh, went back to pre-COVID levels, we actually went up by about twenty five percent. And I think yeah, a lot we're, we're going to come like, back to that. That's that's exciting, and I think. I want to have a conversation with everybody about that tonight, where we see us heading, because yeah. that was what I heard a lot of and I personally experienced. Jeff, what about you? Where are you on the, pan on the continuum? Yeah, so we, uh, we went down to back to the forming phase and really took the opportunity to try and polish some systems and reinvent the wheel as it were. Uh, we went into uh, the storming and, and into norming and we're right, uh, as Jonathan said, on the cusp of performing. The, the team is doing really well. We've got the most cohesive team we've had. We're all excited about the future, you know, with some, uh, with some, an eye out toward what may be coming over the horizon, but it's been a really exciting time. And we too have seen some growth in our practice uh, year to date over last year, not year to date, last month over, over previous year. Great, thank you, Jeff. Hawken, how about you? Um, I mean, I'll echo what everybody said. I think it has been sort of a dynamic flowing between all three on a day-by-day -day basis. I mean, I feel like with Jonathan, what he said, like, I feel like we're in that, you know, norming, forming, like right at that cusp of performing stage. And then something happens either in the news or something happens in the office where, you know, there was perhaps somebody that tested positive or, you know, was in a room with somebody else that all of a sudden knocks us back down. And uh, we kind of go back to that storming phase a little bit of kind of like trying to figure out like, you know, and where we're at and stuff like that. So I think, um, I think like Jonathan, I think we're from forming to, or norming to performing. I think we're on that cusp. It's just, there's little blips through the road that kind of keep knocking you back down and trying to cause reassessment of where you're at. That's great. So yeah, it's dynamic. Uh, Anthea and Miles, what about in your case? So I would say we're like everybody else, like norming, but like performing. And um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that because we didn't know what to expect, you know, when we met three months ago. So I'm happy to say that here we are three months and things are kind of rolling along smoothly. And I just saw a question, um, you know, from somebody, um, Christopher, on the panel that asked if we had had any drop-offs in our offices. And I would say, yeah, it was definitely a curve down, but we've been on the curve up now for, you know, back, back to normal. So if you look at our, you know, our month, you know, last August and this August, or where we're this time last September and where we are this September, things are right where they should be, if not, you know, a little bit better. Great. And I assume you agree, Miles, right? I'm, I'm going to assume when I go to you two that you agree. <laughs> you can't always assume No, that, no okay? fights tonight. No fights. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay. You know, uh, one of the phrases I learned in, in business a while ago that when people are doing really well and then they have challenges, if they don't know why they were doing well, then they're really challenged to succeed when difficult times hit. So, you know, it's always important to understand what makes you do well. And I think all of you do that. And that's why you went into the, you're, you're moving into the uh, performing stage pretty quickly here. Um, I want to go back to our pre-conference course and talk about the experiences you were reporting at that time. You know, and as, as we all remember, when we were shut down, I'm just going to say it was roughly, you know, the 15th to 20th of March, varying around the country, something like that, depending on where you are, um, that it was, it was a shock. You know, I mean, I worked on March 17th, I think. I'm a part-time guy, so I don't have the same issues you face as owners. But I remember on March 17th and what people were thinking, ah, who's going to make an announcement and blah, blah, blah. And then it happened. It was like literally one day to the next. And that's, that's when it happened. And the shock was first about how do, we, how do we keep our business afloat? You know, if you look at a continuum, we could talk all night about that continuum. First, it was about the business and the team and you know, how do I pay my team? What do we do? Do we do unemployment? Uh, then the PPE thing that came out. We're going to talk more <laughs> about that later. Uh, then it was about emergencies. What's an emergency? What isn't? What am I allowed to do? Some of that stuff never got clarified. We just kind of figured <laughs> it out. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I want to ask the panel, uh, I'll ask a couple of you and maybe all of you if, it, if, if, if there's a story you want to tell. Um, if you think back to, to May when we did the pre-conference course, 
you know, I remember one of the top of mind subjects, for example, was aerosols. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about aerosols tonight. Uh, and aerosols, you know, we didn't have a lot of information, but everybody was looking at purifying their air or preventing aerosols or keeping people, whatever the method of dealing with it was. So that's an example. But I want you to give an example to me, and I'll start with you. Um, I'll start with you, Ron, of something yeah. that was really important back then, but it's not very important anymore. But it seemed like the most important thing back then. And maybe an example, I'll, I'll come back at the end and say, what wasn't important then? Well, it seems really important right now. And I'll, I'll have you take the one on what was important and is not as important, Ron. Um, shower caps. I'm <laughs> uh, so, 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 you know, back when we, uh, you know, back when we were worrying about aerosols, particulates and things like that, you know, you, you do a full gown, you do goggles, you do N95s and all that stuff. Um, for, for most, and, and, and as you might recall, I, I did, I, in fact, during the emergency times, I created that little dome and drape method that I draped over, uh, my dinner in this. Yeah, you had a salad ball bowl from, uh, Red Lobster. Olive Garden. <laughs> Olive Garden. That's right. Yeah. The, the takeout salad credit. bowl, right? Yeah. And so, 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 you know, we, I, I was quite worried about that. Now, I, I wouldn't say I stopped worrying, um, but but because we did acquire um, extra Osashkin units, we have additional filtration units inside inside our rooms now. Um, I feel more confident, I guess, in that you know whatever I create is adequately scavenged to the point where I'm less. I don't worry about shower caps so much anymore. That those bouffant caps. And that so, was a big deal back then, though. You're saying it was. Oh, really I, I well, at back yeah, back then, like if I remember, if I was even thinking about touching the air water syringe, I was going to put a cap on. Got and, it. And 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 now, um, you know, if if I'm doing like a super simple occlusal that you know maybe my slow speed round bird turns about. 50 times and that's it um you know with with the, the suction unit 18 inches from the kid's face with my surgically clean air sitting at the corner by the way that's not an endorsement it's just the product i use okay yeah yeah um and 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 you know i, I feel like i'm not as nervous about that piece yeah. Uh, today was my GA day. So I, I, you know, for my GA cases, because I'm generating a ton of it by buzzing teeth down for crowns and stuff like right. that, they'll wear them. Yeah. Uh, I think that's going to come up when we talk towards the end about, you know, what's going to survive in the future. And sure. that's a great example. Hawken, could I go to you and ask you if you have an example of something that's, that was very really important, really important in May, but now not a big deal. Um, it might be sound controversial when I say this, uh, but I think, N95 masks a little bit. Um, and when I say that, you know, we were willing to pay almost, you know, five, ten dollars a mask, you know, and, and trying to acquire as many N95 or KN95 masks. And, you know, we would buy these lots of masks, you know, that were supposed to be certified and, you know, that came over and like, you know, two days later it would say, oh, these are no longer on the list and they're not acceptable for filtration. And, and I think in the beginning, we were so hyper focused on, you know, N95 because of the aerosols and things like that. And I think, uh, you know, I, I don't want to insinuate that I don't think an N95 mask is important, but I think, you know, it's a little bit more picking and choosing the procedures that we're doing. You know, if we're like really, you know, buzzing a ton and there's a lot of, you know, particulate matter coming up, um, you know, we're using it and stuff like that. But you know, a lot of times, you know, with some of the other things we've backed off a little bit where, you know, we're, we're, you know, using level threes or level ones over level threes, if we're doing hygiene checks and things like that, um, you know, trying to, trying to realize that, you know, it's important, but with, with the mania that surrounded it in the beginning of like trying to get these N95 masks, um, I, you know, it, I feel like that I've seen kind of ease up a little bit since we kind of yeah. went back in in May. Yeah, and I think, I, think, I think you're right. I think that's observed. I'm hearing that from a lot of people. And again, I'm not, 
confirming or, or denying Correct. the facts related. I, I think, you know, I think we'll find in our conversation tonight and elsewhere that the whole infection control scenario around COVID uh, was based on what we were already doing, but some enhanced measures based on what we perceived, not that what we knew. I was on a call along with some colleagues representing the APD with the Centers for Disease Control who are revising their policies. And my, what I heard was there is not a lot of evidence that suggests that uh, aerosols can cause transmission of disease. There's a ton of evidence that says that aerosols spread. You can put dye in the water, you can show it's pretty scary looking, but do they transmit disease? And then we get into the conversation about the pre-COVID lesser than PPE that we wore. And the fact that there was a study that came out of, uh, I think Jonathan, you brought that to our attention of Italy, I believe. Mm -hmm couple of days ago that said COVID is not transmitted in the dental office. I think that was, yeah. that was published in a reputable journal. Mm -hmm. They based on some really strong retrospective analysis. We don't have time to get into that tonight, but I, I can say that it seems like, you know, infection control during COVID was more of a religion than a, you know, it was more of a belief than a, a fact, you know. Well, one of my anesthesiologists says that, you know, this is going to be infection control theater. Uh, yeah, this is during mm -hmm. the time where we shut down, you know, like how, who can piss it, put on the best show. And, and I think that the, the unfortunate thing is that we just don't have enough data. Now, Correct. Now we, we know aerosol spread. We know. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, and we know we know virus can survive in aerosol. And, and we have data on that, too. Right. But but just just because now, now I think I think, you know, one, one of uh, one of my good friends here in Washington, uh, chair of the infection control committee actually of the washington board uh dr dave, dave carson. carson yeah yeah mm -hmm. he was talking about how you know now we have to look at load you know exactly how, how much of your load do you need to have to in order to trigger a disease and what is the load that will trigger immune response correct it could be less than you could actually be benefiting with a lower load I mean, that, that thing came up big time with all the surfaces, you know, all the papers mm -hmm. were publishing, you know, leave your Amazon package outside for three days to incubate. <laughs> Everybody right. I knew was doing that, right? Arizona, it's pretty easy. We got some hot sun, you know, <laughs> you can sterilize your instruments maybe that way, but not. <laughs> um, but, you know, yeah. And they were talking about how many days it survives on metal versus plastic versus this, but nobody ever said, but does it cause transmission of disease? And only right. now we're hearing suggestion that those low levels, as you're describing, don't cause transmission. But you know, again, it's not clear, create a lot of confusion. Let, let's get one more. I always want to keep this comment going and then I'm gonna to go to what you're doing now that you weren't doing them. But Jonathan, what are you doing um, that now, uh, what are you doing less of now than you did before? I, I have to echo about the, the N95s and the aerosols. Um, I think it's time for, and this is my personal opinion, that organized dentistry now start to be proactive and start to peel the layers off of the enhanced um, infection control and, 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 and pivot towards standard precautions, which has always been safe uh, on there. We've got the study from Italy that shows that there is zero chances of a dental team member contracting COVID. Um, it goes up if you're a nurse and you, you work in the medical ward. Um, the University of Iowa did a great study um, looking at aerosols generated in the dental school environment, which is a great yeah. environment because you've got Open Bay, which is Correct. like uh, pediatric dentistry. A lot and of they people. Found, yeah, it, in Iowa, they found that there was very little spread beyond the dental assistant area. Um, and so I, I do think that... Um, the, and you're the, talking about spread. You're not talking about transmission of disease, which is yes. another thing. Right. Yeah, right on there. And then also just looking at the media, there's a lot of correlation, but correlation does not necessarily mean causation. For example, um, the most recent report from the CDC said that if you got COVID, you most likely had been to a restaurant two weeks prior. And that just came out this week. And I mean, that's, that may be a correlation, but that's not a causation right, that right. you actually got at the restaurant. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity for residency programs to, to start doing simple studies because we do know that our level two and three masks filter out 98% of particulates while an N95 only does it at 95%. The only difference between an N95 respirator is the seal around the face. The seal, not the filtration, correct. Exactly, correct. Yeah. on there. Um, yeah, and yeah. with the face visor, 
I think that, you know, our, our level twos, ones, and threes are protected, protecting the face masks from, from any vapor. Um, so I, I think we need to, now it's time to get studies to kind of look at what we're doing and, and start tapering back uh, on there. Because I think, and this will go, when we talk about like, the, you know, expenses in the practice, we spend a lot of money on PPE on there and um, you know our, our, yeah. our numbers that we're generating in terms of production are good but are expensive as our well, expenses the bottom line has been affected yeah oh yeah, yeah. that's right yeah and I, th I think you know what we're regarding infection control and we'll probably come back to that in some ways and a few subjects here um, it's one thing that's very clear is we were operating in a vacuum we didn't have all the information dealing with this invisible virus this unknown about does does a aerosol cause transmission we still don't know but what it speaks to is the need for research. And I think that's where us as, a, as the APD and all of us as individuals talking to our colleagues, we can, we, can, we can ask and we can request that we need much more research going forward because there'll be influenza years that aren't good. And that's going to be particularly difficult for pediatric dentistry with kids being more damaged by seasonal influenza than, than COVID. Yeah, right. so we, we need more research on viral transmission in the dental environment, clearly. And I think some money needs to be redirected you know, and I recall, as I'm sure you did, that when you took microbiology in dental school, it was mostly bacteria. We didn't learn a lot right. about viruses. So education needs to go up too. So there's some good things that will happen from this. I want to get a couple and of- And Joel, yes, Joel please. I'm sorry, just okay. as one thing, yeah. I, you know, I just want to, to piggyback off of that and just say, you know, I think the one thing through all of this that I've realized, and I think we probably all have realized with PPE, if somebody's comfort level is wearing an N95 mask, then they should definitely wear an N95 Correct. mask. Yeah. And if somebody's comfort level is somewhere, I mean, I don't, and I think that's the thing. I think there's no right or wrong answer in this anymore. Correct. And I think it's what best suits each practitioner and each staff member that we have too. And I mean, we all have done that where we've now provided all the PPE and, you know, everybody kind of has their comfort level of what they're going to wear and, and stuff like that. But I think it's, Going back to what Jonathan said, I mean, we've always been up on universal precautions from the start, and I we're think, the best. We're the best at this. Yeah. Yep. And now we just have some other pieces to our arsenal that we can use if if we choose. And I think we'll come back. Maybe not tonight. Down the road, we're all going to be looking at to uh, what was stated about peeling back. Jonathan, you mentioned what can we what can we peel back? Regression to the mean. You know, before mm -hmm. we were doing this level of PPE. Now we're doing this level of PPE. Probably we're going to come to some kind of more appropriate middle level, but we'll we'll see what right. that is. Uh, maybe Stop. Jeff, I can go to you, and to me, you could comment on something that you are doing now that you weren't, and you wanted to say something else. Well, I was going to say, being one of the older members of the panel, I remember when the AIDS epidemic was coming, and we started doing all of these isolation things. I started in dental school; we didn't wear gloves. Now I wouldn't think of putting my hand on a patient without gloves. You know, we didn't wear masks. We didn't have all the things that we do as we began our universal precautions and they've served us well for all these years. Yes. And, you know, to, to Jonathan's point, it would be nice to, to establish where there are previously used universal precautions or adequate for protecting us from this new virus. Because I have a, I have a suspicion that it is and we've been comfortable doing these things for a long time. And yeah. so, you know, we're, we're kind of doing the same as we did before with maybe an extra layer of mask uh, maybe a face shield, and uh, one of our one of our dentists has been wearing a face shield. It's amazing to me how much stuff is on that face shield. Whether it's going to make you sick or not, just seeing what's on there kind of makes you aware that there's stuff out there. <laughs> right. That piece might stay. <laughs> that piece right. might stay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Jeff, do you have an example of something that you weren't doing at the beginning in May, let's say, and now it's become really important, and you're doing it more, or more, it's more important to you. You know, I think we've probably gone the other way. I think we're doing less things. I think because there wasn't really any knowledge of what was going to work and there were so many ideas out there. I've got UV wands laying around that have been plugged in for a long time. I got air filtration systems that we turn on every day. Uh, we remodeled the office a little bit. We tried to close in some of the, uh, some of the kids bays and, and the spaces and make it a little more isolated to try and contain whatever aerosols were there. Um, you know, maybe it's a little bit overkill. Um, but I think we just adjusted to uh, the new normal because we were already wearing gowns when we went in to do operative. We were already you know, wearing masks and we weren't wearing shields, but we were already doing quite a bit of those things beforehand. So it wasn't a big shift for us, maybe to throw in a, an N95 underneath a level three because we were already using level threes. 
Um, so it was, really wasn't a big change for us. We were already accustomed to doing what I think was a great job of keeping each other safe. That's great. And I want to point out, I'm looking at the chat. It's going on a lot of lively discussion in our audience about this. And our president, Jessica Lee, just notes there'll be a paper coming out in JADA that will confirm the Italian study results. But we'll get those to everybody afterwards. So several references will come out. You know, that's what we need is data. That's a great source of great piece of information, uh, of data. Does it support this? Yes, please, Jeff. And we'll add one thing that we're not doing as much of. We were pretty, the state of Arkansas had a lot of mandates for us. And so we we're pretty rigorous about keeping family groups far apart. And I think we police that less because they are doing it more naturally. They just, you know, kind of group by themselves. And so, um, you know, I think I'm ready to put toys and games back in the office and, you know, those types of things. But I think the way we're going feels okay for now. Great. And Anthea and Miles, have you guys done something recently that you weren't doing in the beginning that you've kind of migrated to anything? No, uh, at this it's time. It's okay if you haven't. <laughs> yeah, no, at this time, I believe we have titrated to less than more. I mean, we were, okay. we were really focused on limiting numbers of people um, particularly in the clinical. We still are, are working with a virtual waiting room. So we are limiting family members and parents to degree yeah. with the patients that it can accommodate that. But we were really working on spacing individual family members around the, the uh, clinical setting. And uh, we don't have them on top of each other, but in open base setting, uh, we're now putting them on opposite ends of it, but we're not limiting as much in terms of the, the body numbers in the back. Because when we talked three months ago, one of our mandates was still 10 people or less. So if you talk about your team in the back and you had one or two families with two kids, you were already pushing the Over limit. the limit, yeah. Mm -hmm. So at this time, we've, um, we've lessened. We're still social distancing as best we can, but we're not limiting the total body numbers in the back as strictly as we were. And I'm seeing that kind of trend. I think we're, we're seeing a lot of trends here. I mean, the consistency around doing less versus more of the stricter measures. I, I saw that across the panel here, and I'm hearing that from others as well. I want to move into uh, some practice management issues. Um, you know, I think we, we heard that we were concerned in May as some states hadn't even opened yet. I think California, Jonathan, hadn't opened yet at that yeah. point. Uh, others had just opened. We were concerned about whether parents would be okay coming in, would they be afraid of returning with the kids. My finding in my, in my own experience and in talking to others, that's a non-issue. Would everybody just show of hands and say, do you agree? <laughs> non-issue? Was it an issue for you, Ron? Were they afraid? Um, you know, some, some were, and, 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 you know, this, this is a, and I'm sure every, every practice here has, has, has the entire spectrum. You have the people who just thought that everything we do is ridiculous because this is not even real. And then you have the people who thought that, you know, we aren't doing enough. Right. And, and, and so, but, but by and large, what I found is that um, families have been appreciative um, yeah, yeah. I, I heard that many times myself, and I'm part time. Like, we're grateful you're open that you'll see our children. We're grateful we could bring our children in. That's yeah. something I heard a lot. Jonathan? Yeah, I have a story. Um, so we see kids from six months of age all the way through through college, on there, and then then we graduate them out of the pediatric general home. And uh, you know, we had one college student graduating. It was time for him to graduate to the general dentist, and and we said, okay, so, you know, you're great. Now it's time to graduate you out. And, and he came up to said, you know, can you please keep me in the practice? Because, you know, right now, 2020, it's unprecedented times. And you bring normal, normalcy to me, a normal routine on there. And so that kind of says a lot for our profession as pediatric dentists and the dental home, um, where we actually provide a service. And, and, and we're basically their, their dental home and their family. And so it says a lot that the patients really appreciate what we do. And oftentimes, you know, we, we focus on the negative, but we have to look at the positives and like, wow, yeah, we do make a difference in there. Yeah, it's a great and, story. And that also shows how much they trust us as <clears throat> medical yeah. providers. You know, you build relationships with these families and they trust you and you know that you're taking good care of them and their kids. So I think that says a lot. About they trust it. you in all ways, not just to, not just for the dental specific, but to keep them safe and to keep everybody safe. They trust you. It all goes together. 
I wanted to ask <clears throat> each of you perhaps um, regarding restorative needs. You know, there was a lot of conversation back in May and before in March and April. You know, we have all this treatment, all these treatment plans, a lot of class twos out there. They're going to get into dentin that are only in enamel and, you know, some of the dentin ones are going to get into pulp. We're going to have all these emergencies. And we had patients scheduled for restorative that had to be canceled because it was elective, quote unquote. So did you see a big increase in restorative uh, when you reopened and has that been sustained? Uh, I'll start with you, Ron. Well, so what we, what I found, uh, uh, I feel like our kids have gotten COVID cavities, or co cavities, whatever you want to call it. it you know, the, through the, through the, through the lockdown, those nine, 10, 12 weeks, um, routines gone out the window. They, they, they snack more often because, you know, they, their parents get anxious, they get anxious, they hit the pantry. They I mean, feed them goldfish all day long. <laughs> right. And so, so, so there was an option. I, I feel like, you know, despite all the prevention stuff we do in our, in our, in our clinic, we have, uh, have an uptick in, in restorative. Um, typically, if one of my patients needs something done, I can find them a slot within 14 days. Right now, I think I'm going out about 21, 25 days in order to find a restorative slot for them. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a need. It's sure. increased. Jeff? Yeah, I think, I think uh, we were defining emergencies as something we thought might end up uh, with an abscess. And so we worked through the kids that already needed pulps and crowns. And then we opened things back up to elective. We were certainly busy, but uh, you know, I think, think Ron's probably onto something about the COVID cavities and just the poor habits. We've had a steady flow of patients needing operative dentistry in the practice. It, it feels like it's kind of like it was before, uh, which obviously is helpful for our providers to stay busy. Yeah, it's kind of like that movie, Where Were You When the Lights Went Out, about the blackout in New York and all the babies afterwards. We're seeing the right. cavities <laughs> afterwards. Uh, it's a little bit worse, I think. And you're um, right about the goldfish. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, Hawken, what are you seeing in restorative? Uh, we have people, I, I mean, want to interrupt real quick and say, you know, our panel comes from all over the country. So we're getting perspectives from different places, which is good. So I would mirror off of Jeff. I think we tried to, you know, during lockdown, um, tried to work through those kids that were the most extreme kids. Um, and so I, I think, you know, we're, we're seeing sort of uh, an increase on what I think, you know, what Ron's talking about, I think just because um, all sort of uh, schedules went out the window and I think still are out the window a little bit. And, you know, I think the one thing I've noticed that maybe you guys have noticed too is, is um, somehow kids behavior recently seems to be a little bit more sort of out of whack. Um, I think I think this summer has been really hard psychologically on the kids, meaning, mm -hmm. you know, there weren't routines, they weren't the camps, you know, and I'm speaking broadly. Um, and they're, they're, you know, I've always felt that kids thrive on sort of routine. And I think because everything's been put out of whack a little bit, I think, you know, I find that a lot of kids um, are, are a little bit more, you know, just, tired and and you know more difficult to treat and stuff um and i and I, i've noticed that a little bit as sort of summer has ended and now school and in, in our state school is virtual so the kids are still at home and things like that and i just i just find that um that's happened a little bit and the interesting part is with the virtual school and i don't uh, and i'll pose this to you guys too is is <laughs> i have kids I would say, you know, in that slot from 10 to 12 o'clock or whatever, that was always kind of that die down time, a little bit hygiene, or you'd have those cancellations, you know, kids are coming in like with their laptop or, you know, on the yeah. iPhone and they're, they're remoted into school, you know, and they're just like, hold on, I'm going to yeah. get my teeth chain. So that's been kind of interesting to see too, as like school has kind of gotten back in and, and in our case being virtual. And we can make our um, waiting rooms into school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've said hi to plenty of teachers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. way by the Zoom camera. Anthony and Miles, restorative increase. I I think there's I think there is an increase, and I think there will be an increase. And something interestingly that we found and been talking about is we have uh, I feel like a lot of kids that have fallen out of cycle are now showing back 
up. Um, you know, they might have been an 18, 24 month and they've had issues. And I don't know if it's because the parents are concerned that they won't be able to get their kids back in or something will happen between now and the time, like we'll be shut down again. Mm -hmm. But um, I feel like it's bringing more restorative needs that have been unmet or people who are out of their routine frequency of recall. And I also agree with Hawk and I feel like especially certain age range kids that are already tapped into uh, perhaps too much social media and are hearing far more than we would have heard as kids their age are having difficulty with processing what's going on in the outside world and it's influencing how they're coping within uh, the environment of our dental care. So yeah, uh, yeah, but I definitely think there's going to be an increase in caries rate. Yeah. And I think whether we so, actually realize that increase, we'll see it's one of those data points, but we're hearing that from everybody, but at a minimum, I think what we are seeing for sure, what we're observing is the parents are making an association between not being able to go to the dentist and the fear of getting cavities. I think that's a fair assumption. We're, do you agree? I think we're seeing that perception. So their idea that we're the advisors, we're the ones that counsel them, we're the ones that detect it early is validated because they're clearly seeing that connection. Would you say, Jonathan, I'll go to you. Maybe you can respond to that. I'd say that our existing patient pool and families, we haven't seen an uptick of tooth decay in that population, but where we've seen an increase in tooth decay and treatment are our new patients that are coming in where you know, we were so prepared to go and re-emerge into practice, there are still dentists that aren't um, operating. And so we're getting a lot of those calls to come in to see us. And um, it's almost like residency level decay, where we've got a lot of tooth decay and kind of echoing um, what, what our other colleagues are saying. Um, the behavior in that group, where these kids do not have a dental home in the pediatric practice, um, their behavior is a little different, a little bit more challenging uh, yeah. on them. Um, I find that behavior within our population is actually improved. Like my pre-existing patients, they're, they're, they're wonderful now. Um, I think they're better than when they were pre-COVID. Um, but these new patients that are coming in um, with lots of decay that did not have the advantage of going, growing up in a pediatric dental home, um, they, they can be a little bit challenging uh, yeah. on there. Great. I want, I want to move to our audience and uh, we're going to try doing a poll here. So if, uh, for all of you out there, and there's a lot of you out there, um, we're going to do a little poll. And the first question, and I'm going to ask Kelly to put it up on the screen. It's going to ask you if you took advantage of the PPP program. And just answer, you can answer both of these. Uh, uh, let's see, just, just answer the first one. It says, did you take advantage of the PPE program? Yes or no? So we'll get the audience to answer yes or no. We can't vote, only you. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, we can't vote. I tried to vote too. Yeah, if you're from Chicago, you can vote often. We're, we're very compliant. <laughs> we, we see your survey, we want to answer it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, Kelly, are we ready to show the results yet? Do we have results? Mm. Here we go. So about 65% wow. applied for the PPP. And if we look, if they've received it, the, if they applied for forgiveness, if they received it, 81% said no, or 80, it's 80, 20. So most have not received forgiveness yet. Jeff, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I just have a, a question. I'm wondering if the no means that they've not applied yet for forgiveness. I'm wondering if the one. Yeah, that, that was applied. actually, it was a three foil. We're missing one of the foils, but uh, it might mean that. That's correct. It might mean they didn't apply for forgiveness yet. So it probably includes both groups. So it looks like 20, regardless, 20% 20 have received the forgiveness. The other 80% is probably a combination of didn't apply for or didn't receive it. That's right. Well, I think I'm, I'm impressed like that. In California. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, I'm impressed that a third of us didn't, didn't, didn't need it. Or chose not to for whatever yeah. reason. Well, they, they may, you know, that third may be people that are uh, employee dentists also probably. Could be. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a, yeah, it's not a perfect, uh, perfect question, but it gives us some sense. Yeah. And then Thank of you. the forgiveness, um, how many of those were 
at that 150k level on there, which is automatic forgiveness if, if right. your loan was less than 150k. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll we'll have to get more information. And I know that uh, <clears throat> you know the ADA is getting some of this information through their policy center, and, and Paul and the, our policy center are looking at these. There's so much, so much data to collect around so many things. We'll be getting after that later, including this, the infection control things. So let's go back to our questions for the panel. Um, you know, early on, we, we talked about the aerosol thing again. That was one of the hot topics. It affected everything we did in some ways. It affected, you know, spacing in the office. It affected going by an air purifier. It affected what procedures we did. So I want to ask about today. Uh, are you using a rubber cup profi in your practice today? Are you using a Cavitron? Or maybe you're just using a toothbrush profi? I'll start with you, Jonathan. Uh, so since the beginning of the pandemic, um, we've always used Cavitrons, rubber cup profies, and high-speed handpieces. Um, we supplemented the high-speed evacuator with those dry cups on there. We, I was comfortable to, to know that the data showed that 90% of the aerosol generated in the dental office gets absorbed uh, and sucked up by the HVE. Um, the dry cups, they were just there to kind of catch the extra 10%. Uh, on there just over time using it. Um, they're really loud. <laughs> so we're, you know, we're, we're talking about aerosols, but we got to look at safety in general. How about our eardrums from the, from the decibels, you know, from all these purifiers going on and our hearing, you know, because we know that, you know, dentists lose their high pitch hearing over time. And Have you used a decibel meter happening. from your phone to measure the sound level? Yeah. I mean, that'd be something that'd be That'll good. be your research to do. You can get back, please. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious on that. I'll do a blog on that. Do a blog on that. That's a good one. Ron, what about you in these areas? What are you doing? Um, so, so, so we have gone to a, um, a paceless profi angle. Um, I don't know if you guys know about the product available, but there is actually a paceless um, profi angle that, that has the polishers built in. They're, they're, they're a bit more expensive and they don't, honestly, they don't do as good a job. Um, but we, we kind of stayed with that um, till uh, more recently uh, um, because our, our particular county numbers are coming down, um, things are improving and, and you know, we, we not, not to mention that th those profi angles, I guess, people were onto them, so, so it's harder to get now. So we, 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 we saved a box of that for people who just really can't handle paste. And, and we have gone back to using paste now. Um, we, we never had a Cavitron, um, cause I, I don't really see teens and, and, you know, those too much calculus. Yeah. yeah the, the lower interiors, I scrape them off, you know, right. that's, that's a, um, but yeah, w again, with the, with their chloral suction in place, with the air purifiers in place, with the HVV already in the mouth, um, I feel like, um, yeah, I mean, going back to, pace, back to, back to where we began. And, and yeah. I think, again, I think everybody would agree that all these decisions along that continuum of then till now are based on the still unknown ability of an aerosol to cause disease. Right. Is that fair? You know, well, and, and, and I, I, I think really, really important too is your local environment. I mean, if, you're, if your city or your county is doing a pretty bang up job in bringing the number down and, you know, I, I, I check it, uh, I used to check it multiple right. times a day back in the, back in the <laughs> pandemic. Now I check it about twice a right. week. It's all about um, risk of number of patients in the county having it today or new exactly. cases. Exactly, and, and, and who's getting it, right? Right, uh, right. In my county, they, we, I, I'm lucky enough to have them break it down by uh, age. And yeah, so, I mean, you know, now we see that the upticks are coming from basically college age young adults who thinks they're indestructible and, and, you know, business people who are starting to have more contacts with other business people. Yes. Um, yeah, but, no, it's based on those numbers and I think we're, and what we haven't talked about enough is the benefit of the screening programs we do, you know, of the historical uh, questions we ask, the temperature taking, mm -hmm. maybe that has less benefit. I don't know, but it's, it's, it's some, one, of, one of the, I think it was, his name is, uh, I can't remember his name, but he was the former FDA commissioner. He said that the screening practices in each one themselves aren't particularly helpful, like the temperature and the history 
but he said it's like Swiss cheese. You put three layers of Swiss cheese together and you cover up all the holes. Oh, so, okay. you know, you, you, have, you have a system that has multiple checks. And I think, I think the screening and the temperature, all part of screening, has been pretty effective. Again, we don't know. We haven't gotten the data so, yet. So, so lately, though, lately, though, we've been finding that the people are now checking off the screen well, answering the screening questions or checking off the boxes like they do our consent forms, meaning that they don't read it. Okay, or, or, or they're, they're not they're not necessarily being completely true. And that's on us. We have to really kind of we have to stay. Right. I so, think when we get to the end, we talk about what's going to survive. I think that's going to survive. Yeah. So yeah, so well, I, just just as a tip, I mean, we in our office, our assistants are now asking the kids where they've been. Mm -hmm. because, you know, the parents are saying, "Oh, we didn't go anywhere." And you ask the kids, it's like, "Oh, yeah, we went to the beach last time, You know, last this past weekend." Or, or and then you can cross-examine the parents afterwards, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's like, "Oh, yeah, Jeff, we just went from we, we just went to visit New Mexico, our cousins." And it's like, parents says, "No, yeah. we didn't go anywhere." It's our like, witness okay. says that you said this, but anyway, <laughs> Jonathan, do you want to comment on this one? Yeah. So uh, we were a hybrid system in terms of electronic charting and, and paper charting. So we had all digital um, imaging, like x-rays and stuff, but we still had a traditional paper chart on there. And so, you know, pa when patients would fill out the paper chart, they would fill out the medical history very detailed, but they would skip on the demographic stuff, like what their occupation was um, and, and insurance information, right? And so with COVID, we did all electronic health records. And we found that the parents are very detailed in entering the insurance information, their demographic information, but they're really short on the medical history part. There's times where they forgot to mention that they had a heart murmur or that they're allergic to latex or allergic to drugs that we have found in their paper chart on there. So that's just something that about human well, I mean, it's, It speaks to that we get, it's easy to get cavalier about history taking. It happens with physicians yeah. even more. And it's actually one of the more important parts of a medical exam with a physician mm -hmm. is the history. And if we're yes. not, if, we, if they don't get honest information from us, if we lie to our doctor, we're not getting much help. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that's something you don't lie to your doctor, your lawyer, or whoever else, you know, yes. and, and we, we have to, we have to encourage openness mm -hmm. regarding that and particularly now, but I want, I want to come back to some more things here related to this. Cause we have so many questions. And by the way, uh, several of the questions that I'm seeing relate to, this big issue that we're having related to getting access to the OR, um, you know, that's, that's a business practice issue that we can't get our patients into hospitals. And in some states, like I know where Ron is in Washington, they have really good office-based anesthesia and the regulations are such that it's easy to do it. That's true in many states, but in some states it's not allowed at all. So uh, I wanna pu put a plug in for a podcast I did with Roger Sanger that's gonna go live next Tuesday. And he talks about all these issues about opportunities to improve access to surgery center concepts, maybe in the office or otherwise. And we're also seeing the APD together with the ADA going to our, um, our legislators, et cetera, to try to fix this problem because it's a problem that I think is an excuse in some cases to keep us out. Um, that's got to get fixed. One of the answers is more office-based anesthesia. We have a specialty of dental anesthesia, but there are other answers. So we're not gonna have time to get into that tonight, but I wanted the audience to know that we are addressing that through various means and I urge you to tune into that podcast. We're keeping the conversations going and we're doing a lot as an organization to improve that opportunity. So I wanna to get to another question. Yeah, Hakan, do you wanna comment on that? Real, yeah, really quick. I mean, cause um, I'm in the group where here in Baltimore, uh, we, go to an actual hospital and, and do OR cases. And I will say, I think the difficulty in OR cases now has become, and, and, and I know this probably again varies from state to state, but in our particular case, a hospital wants our kids to get COVID tested, you know, 72 hours prior to, you know, their uh, appointment. And, you know, it's just silly things that, you know, that go on where, you know, for example, you know, I have a case tomorrow where the kid went, four days prior and the hospital wants to cancel the case now because it wasn't done within 72 hours. Um, or, uh, you know, we've had times where, you know, we, we go to the OR and, you know, we didn't get a test result back in a, in a quick enough amount of time because labs were overloaded. Um, and, you know, 
so we did a um, we did a rapid test there at the hospital before the surgical case. And that was on a Friday, and then you know Monday we come into the office and the PCR test was positive for the kid, you know, and so you know then as a practitioner you're like, well, I just did this entire case on this kid that I thought was negative, and it turned out that they were COVID positive, um, which goes back to the PP. It goes back to universal which, precautions. Yeah, which is, you know, when, when, when I spoke with, you know, the, the um, employee health at the hospital, they were like, you know, as long as there's no symptoms and you're wearing your PPE, there's no, you know, precautions that need to be taken at this time. But I think as far as access to care to the hospital, I think I've just found one of two things. It's, it's a little bit more of a hurdle now, you know, to be testing, COVID testing two-year-olds and putting families through another hurdle to right. actually get to the OR. Um, and I find a lot of, about half the families that were scheduled for the OR are at the point of saying, well, we're not gonna go till the COVID test is not required anymore. Well, there's a the general so fear of going to hospitals anyway. I mean, right. obviously people are postponing medical care of all sorts. If they're gonna postpone a colonoscopy or a heart check, they're probably gonna, be, it's gonna be easier to postpone a dental, I think. But, oh, but so here. that's the impact I think it's had on the OR you know, yeah. as far as seeing kids. Yeah. But, but I think in some cases there are excuses being made because, you know, right. dentistry doesn't have the same level. But anyway, I, it, it, this is a battle that we need to fight and because it, it's good for our kids and their health. And uh, there'll be a lot coming out around that. Speaking of, Hawken, what you said about uh, exposures, um, I know, Jeff, you wanted to share some stories. And I want to talk specifically, and this is several of the questions around this. Is there a protocol about a potential exposure to a team member uh, okay. where testing is available to verify positive or negative, how long it's complicated, how long after exposure, how many tests. Um, an example would be, and I think you have some examples, would be a key team yeah. member who lives with parents who tested positive but has right. no symptoms. And this varies in every state, in every jurisdiction, but maybe just talk to us generally about this important yes, subject. So that, that is something that happened. We had one of our key team members, and uh, I've heard from a number of colleagues finding adequate staffing levels uh, post COVID has been a challenge for a lot of people. So one person being gone is really, really hurt. And one of our young ladies came in and said that her parents had tested positive and she didn't know what to do. And so we did work with medical doctors, our local hospital health folks, and we had her tested a couple of weeks, uh, I mean, a few days after. So this was on a Friday that her parents found out that they were positive. And then on Monday, she's telling us, so they felt like it was okay. She had no symptoms, nothing. Um, so we had her tested, waited for three more days, had her tested again, came out negative both times. We were told, well, as long as she doesn't exhibit any symptoms and wears her PPE, you're fine. And uh, <clears throat> it just kind of felt funny. I've looked around trying to find something from the CDC that includes the ability of testing to see whether or not somebody actually has the virus or not. And I've not found that. I've found if you've worn your PPE, adequately and you weren't together more than 15 minutes without PPE, PPE on, uh, then you would isolate or check for symptoms. I mean, it seems to kind of be all over the board. Yeah. And as scary as this virus seemed in the beginning, you know, I, I would like to have more, uh, more knowledgeable guidance about exactly how to, how to incorporate the use of tests. Well, your, your statement of what you were told is inconsistent with the notion that there are so many people with COVID who are carriers that don't have symptoms. Right. So when they say watch for symptoms, that's inconsistent with that statement. Mm -hmm. Then we also know that kids are often ones that maybe have a certain load of virus, but don't have enough to either transmit it or have symptoms. Right. And that's, that, that's a little bit, you know, that, that seems to be sort of universally stated and there's some studies about that, but again, we're going to learn more. I think one of the hardest things for our staff, they are very close to one another. And yeah. in a tight space at lunch or whatever, when you take the mask off and you're eating, I think that's been one of the biggest adjustments for our staff trying to stay away from each other yeah. during what would normally be social time. I think that's, that's been a big challenge for us. And I'm hearing from, uh, I, I know a team that works in New York and in other places. I'm hearing from academic teams that work together. They're going back to work now. And one of the issues that's being faced is that people are, there are people who are scared themselves to go back and they want to observe the safe practices six feet apart. Okay. There's even a song about it. Um, yeah, that's a good song by, uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Luke Combs sings six feet apart. 
any <laughs> case, um, they want to be six feet apart, but they're afraid to tell their coworker or their friend, you're violating my space. You know, so I think there's a cultural change because, you know, people like you mentioned sitting together in the lunchroom, you know, you see that all over the place. Probably several of the people who were there would rather be six feet apart, <laughs> you know, but they're afraid, you know, you know, there's sort of a culture thing, but we, we won't get into that. But I think that's part of what, what I'm seeing, what we're recognizing that we have to, just like, just like a, a team member, I forgot what they call it in aviation. You know, there were a lot of aviation accidents that related to the fact that the that the first officer wasn't allowed, didn't feel comfortable speaking mm -hmm. up to the captain. Cockpit management, something, I forgot, but, it, but it's, it's, it's that now we have in dentistry and we extract a tooth, you know, I always ask the dental assistant, that's tooth B right there, isn't it? Yeah. That's not B, this is B. And that's the one I'm taking out, you know, to do double, triple yeah. checks. jaco has got a lot of rules around marking teeth. Mm -hmm. and that's based on team communicating. And I think the same, it's a safety measure, the kind of things that our safety committee is looking at, that maybe we should think about safety as a team effort and that people should feel comfortable speaking up around perceived safety issues for the benefit of the team, just like they would about possibly extracting the wrong tooth. You know, same thing. <laughs> we had, a, we've had a few incidences where somebody later turned out to have been exposed and didn't know if they were positive. We've tested our entire staff three or four times because of those things. So we decided to close our break room that they couldn't have lunch in the break room. So what'd they do? They all went and piled in one car together. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm just not waiting <laughs> yeah. for that. I'm just not getting ahead of this. That's good. Yeah. So Kristen yeah. Barden, thank you. You told me correctly that it's called crew resource management. I love why I'm an aviation buff and I couldn't remember the phrase. So thank you, Kristen. Crew resource management. There's a lot of research on that. It applies to us directly. And I think we'll learn a lot about that in this um, COVID crisis. So um, are you mandating testing? I'll just ask a couple of you and your, of your staff in your office at all. Is anybody, get to, anybody testing people just randomly or? No, I haven't heard, heard much of that without, unless they have an exposure or have a reason to believe they need to be tested. Well, in, in some of the jurisdictions, you, you are still not able to obtain a test unless you, have, you are a suspected, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a potential history of exposure. So um, yeah, it's not as easy to get. It's getting easier, but I, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's you know, you, anybody can just go get it. Jeff, and Jeff, you said yeah. it's cockpit resource management. Right. I think I've heard both crew and cockpit, but... Anyway. So we have a local oral surgeon who has patients flying from all over the nation. And so he, he does the uh, quick test before every single procedure. And it's interesting, he's finding a lot of people, especially teenagers coming in for wisdom teeth, have already had the virus without any symptoms and didn't realize that they've got the antibodies already developed. And yeah. so that, that is their protocol. He, he's telling me that he's got the test cost down. I think he said he's around $15 in the, in the numbers that he orders. And he just feels it's a safety thing. That could be a protocol if this remains a really a violent problem for younger patients for us. But Yeah. Well, it may be something with influenza in the future, actually, because right? they're more likely to be carriers who get symptoms and the disease. So that's a different subject completely. We're going to learn a lot about what we never did for seasonal influenza that we may be doing in the future. But we'll come back to that. Um, I want to talk about... Uh, PPE issues. You know, one of the other things on the continuum early on, you know, we had the business worried about our businesses and our team and the infection control and emergencies, but obviously PPE was a big issue. And you just, this N95, somebody told me that all the dental dealers in the United States last year sold 125 N95 masks. <laughs> and, but Home Depot down the street for painters sold like 2000 of them or more, you know, in fact, they've got the, I think they're called P95s or even better because they prevent oil in addition. Yeah. I actually have one in the garage that I had from painting, but I don't know if it's any good. But, um, but that was a big issue, supply chain. And it wasn't just PPE. It was the, the whole education business was disrupted. And we're not gonna have time to talk about that. Uh, that's an exciting thing. I think we've had so many great things happen, but we may have time to come to one part of that. But so what about the supply chain, everybody? Uh, masks, gowns, sanitation supplies. What about today? I know what was deal back then, it was all an issue. What about today? What's an issue relative to what you need? Jonathan, I'll start with you. Um, I'd say that we're, we're, we're good with N95s and KN95s and 
I'd like to thank the Academy and ADA and um, the CDA for us in California for actually getting us the emergency supplies that the government procured. Um, pricing has seemed to have leveled off, um, which is good. Um, I, just, I just have a question and maybe the data will kind of show up, but <clears throat> where, like the guidelines say that masks have to be changed when they're visibly soiled. So where did the recommendation come where we have to change masks between every patient? Because it's not in it's not in the dental guidelines. Have you seen them visibly soiled before? That's that's another question too, right? Yeah. What what compromise visibly soiled? Is it like when it's wet and damp, right? And if we got face shields on, it's not going to get wet and damp from the patient or the aerosol. Um, but I, I would I would say that PPE um, right now are are N95 um, masks they're available. It's a little bit harder to find the level twos and threes. Um, now I read in the paper that um, nitro gloves, <laughs> there's a shortage of nitro gloves because the United States does not make any nitro gloves. Um, it's all outside of the country. So that's the next shortage um, that we're gonna face. And that was in the paper, I think two days ago. Are you having, a short, are you having any issues with PPE right now? Me? Uh, no. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Jeff, how about you? You having any issues? The only thing that we're nervous about are the uh, the wipes for the chairs. So we, every yeah. time we have an opportunity, we're ordering those. We hear that there may be a disruption there. Um, we order gloves every time we get a chance. I'd rather have some sitting around and be able to relax that. So we're a little bit nervous about that. Yeah. So far, we've not run out of anything. Okay. Uh, Anthony and Miles, you're good? Yeah. We're we had an issue recently with wipes that were, that were back ordered, but... I think we've got hopefully enough until they show up, but uh, yeah. nothing in terms of PPE okay. at this time. Good, Ron. Well, my my preferred um, my preferred uh, sanitation wipes and and liquids and stuff like that was um, just unavailable for two and a half months or two uh, two months, I think, and so that that really was bad because I ended up having to use other products that ended up damaging my equipment. Yeah, that can happen. And so, so um, now um, the liquid form is available. So I, we're buying sprays, but the wipes are not. And, and um, what I'm hearing, at least from all of the supply houses around me, uh, is that wipes are wipes are or dwindling because the, the that cloth material are all getting turned into masks and gowns and stuff like that and yeah, so yeah. so we just been you know ordering extra case of paper towels and and using our spray and right. so so now now that the spray is available we're buying more of that and and doing that Gloves yeah. are fine. We haven't. I haven't personally seen a big jump in glove prices yet. Um, I know I see a comment there saying the the glove costs have really just gone up. Um, I, I I haven't. I I personally haven't got uh, gotten that. But my gloves are not nitrile. Yeah. Um. It it's it's that um it's that new uh, new compound um poly propylene. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, I, yeah, I, th yeah. So, I think regarding wipes, by the way, what's interesting is if you look at the U.S. versus Europe, and I lived in Europe for six years, you know, like a while ago, when after, you know, we, after the AIDS crisis in 1983, when Kimberly Gregalis said she got AIDS from her dentist, that's when infection control was born, as we know it. And the U.S. went to plastic and wipes. Europe went to sprays and designing equipment that can withstand those sprays. It's mm -hmm. really interesting. When I went there, it was totally the opposite. So you were talking about switch. Some people were saying switching to sprays. I wouldn't be surprised. It's cheaper too, that if mm -hmm. we go to sprays as opposed to wipes, even yeah. for a whole household. Yeah. Yeah, and we've always done um, sprays in our office. Spray, right. wipe, spray. Even in the university at ULP with Eve Cooney, when I was a dental student, we were always taught spray, wipe, spray. And we yes. never had the we never had the, the wipes on there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so um, aside, yeah, and and honestly, I mean the 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 spray bottle that little bottle has more liquid in it than your yeah. can of spray to uh, your can of wipes typically. So you you know just by buying the liquid and 
quote unquote, making your own wipes, you get a lot better value. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that's good. The, the other okay. thing that okay. was, go ahead, Ron. I had a hard time. Sorry, I, I, I'll, I'll just finish. Um, yeah. The other thing I had a real hard time for a while is disposable gowns. And, and then so- I remember that. And it was super expensive. So uh, we, we, we have now switched to our local Cintas guys. And uh, they do our gowns for us now. Uh, much more affordable, much more environmentally friendly. Uh, yeah. Actually more comfortable too. We, we Definitely more comfortable, natural. Hakan yeah. and then Jeff wanted to say something. Um, so, I mean, I'll mimic or I'll, I'll go along with everybody. I would say wipes is one of the harder things to buy, but we've kind of switched over to sprays at this point because we think it's more economical and, and, and I think it does better. The one thing I never thought I would realize is um, hand sanitizer wise, I know everybody's making hand sanitizer. I've realized what a Purell snob and that's not endorsement for Purell. <laughs> but uh, what I've realized is, I mean, I can't, you know, when this started, we bought the, you know, a little electric, foam dispensers, you know, to put in all ops and put yeah. all over the office, but you can't now buy the refills anywhere. I mean, they're, right. they're just gone. And um, so, you know, with using other hand sanitizers and keeping it around, um, it, it's just funny. I, I, I just, you know, with some of these sanitizers, I mean, I'll sit there and we'll buy like a case of something and it'll just be like, oh, this is the most God awful smelling <laughs> stuff ever, you know? Um, but so on, on that side of thing, I mean, I know hand sanitizer is ubiquitous now and you can find it all over the place, whether it's, you know, at your membership warehouse or whatever. Um, but, but it's the one thing that, you know, if I could find the little foam dispenser in refills, um, that, that would be the one thing I wish that I could find now. Yeah. It'll, it'll get there in a month or so. Jeff. Yeah. A couple of things. One comment on the, on the Hawkins, we did make our own sanitizer and uh, aloe and uh, pure grain alcohol smells like bad tequila, but yeah. the music up a bit pretty mellow <laughs> yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. So it's got some side benefits. Uh, we started using those, those heavy duty kitchen gloves uh, to turn chairs over. And that has really helped because they're very durable. And if you take them off carefully, you're not gonna cross contaminate. And so that's been one thing we've done to cut down on the number of, of uh, gloves that we're using. And we just have people that are dedicated to turning over chairs that wear those gloves. Mm -hmm. So switching gears, just a, this is for the panel, and I'm going to put you on the spot. If the FDA said, I've got a vaccine today, are you going to be one of the first to take it? I got my flu shot two weeks ago, by the way. Tell the audience, if you haven't, go get this reminder, get your flu shot. How many of you are going to take the vaccine right away? I am. I'm older. <laughs> no? Okay. Second tier. Second tier. Okay. Like the day yeah. after me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. okay. I'll let you know when I take it, Ron, and then if 14 days goes by and I'm okay, then you can do it too. Okay. Or something <laughs> like that. Um, so I want to, we're going to poll the audience, our audience now on their practice business capacity. And Kelly, I think this is one that you're going to put up, which is, um, yeah, during this time, are you as busy, would hope like to be uh, less busy on the bottom or in the middle, busier than you anticipated in terms of your practice. We asked the panel that earlier, but we want to hear from the audience. So are you as busy as you'd like to be right now, busier than you anticipated relative to when we shut down or less busy? It says less busier, but it should be less busy. Yeah. Are we ready, Kelly, to show the results yet? If we had enough votes, we can wait a second. I'm curious on this one. I'm bated breath waiting to see the answer of the audience. I'm gonna guess, well, I won't guess. I don't wanna skew the, the crowd. Oh, do we lose it? There we go. Well, it's a pretty even mm. split. Mm. Busier is the winner, slightly. I don't know if it's statistically significant. <laughs> uh, a little bit less than a third are less busy and 31% are as busy. So, you know, I wonder if we would have asked this question before COVID in February of this year or December of last year, what the response would have been. I wouldn't be surprised if it was similar. In other words, there were still 30% who were less busy than they'd like to be. You know what I mean? There is some data on the ADA, the ADA about that, and I think even from the APD, but we'll, we'll come back to that one. There'll be one of many things that we'll, we'll come back to that's interesting. So what have been some of your strategies this is for the panel uh, for filling the schedule during drop-off you know, that is coming now, you know, it's back in school, there's, it's clear, this is the time of year when 
when practices are slow anyway, right? Although you mentioned that maybe they're more willing to come certain times because they do it on a laptop. Clearly, we're going to see a little drop off now in the fall, as we always do, right? Uh, well, until we get to an end of insurance season, which is <laughs> end yeah. of the year. The, this, the, this fall coincides with the very beginnings of the shutdown six months ago. And, and, right. and uh, just like all of you, you know, we, we, our bread and butter is the six month recall. So, so now is the time when the schedule starts to dry up a bit. Right. Uh, and and uh, for, for me, I, I don't know about anybody else. For me, I'm looking forward to taking a few days off. <laughs> <laughs> I have to agree with Ron that, um, you know, when we were, we are seeing less capacity because of social distancing, but we're busier because our schedule slots are all filled. So we don't have that traditional dead time between 10 o'clock and two o'clock on there. So it's all booked, even though, you know, um, we're seeing less number of patients. We're actually busy throughout the day where there's actually no time to do administrative work. We're just on fire doing clinical work. Um, and so I think we're busier because our schedules are more efficient. Our front offices are getting the chairs filled because you know, what's an empty chair? It, it's, it's, it, you're not making money with an empty chair uh, on there. And so I think we're, we're busier. And uh, I think that's why most people are appreciating their weekends now um, because we're tired by the time Friday comes. Yeah. Others? I would say, like, you know, we are, we're at that place now, you know, six months ago was, we were totally closed. So our six month hygiene schedule now for October, you know, was not looking very good. And we were kind of, you know, panicked about it and a little worried about it, but you know, our team has still been working really hard. I mean, I think we've gotten almost all of the people who we had to cancel their appointments, you know, and right. Um, March, March and April yeah. and parts of May, um, but there's still some that are still kind of calling in. So we've just been making a conscious effort to funnel them to October so that we can get everybody back in. Yeah. And then, um, like you said too, with some drop off time coming off, we are taking some, you know, time, time to take. downtime off too. Yeah. And um, and we told everybody that you know our staff might going to be a little bit slower. But then at the same time, our operative schedule is busier. So, so we goldfish have, come in again. Yeah, we kind of exactly <laughs> back to the goldfish problem. So we yeah. have this dynamic of like the hygiene schedule kind of dropping off a little bit, but then our operative schedule is is picking back up. And we're yeah. In that regard, I'm working more than I normally would to try to accommodate some of these operative appointments. You know, I want to add, for, before the others chime in, I want to add into this question. During the town hall we had with uh, Sheila Raja, the clinical psychologist, talking about, you know, our well-being and depression, and we had uh, some really challenging things happen in, in, our, in our group. And we talked about measures to take to identify emotional turmoil within ourselves and our own well-being. Are you seeing some of that? And it was actually, I mentioned it now because it was tied into, in part, to the kind of lull that we might have now and that, you know, we've been kind of on a sugar high, so to speak, you know, mm -hmm. over the last month, just kind of manage the practice and it's been busy and managing and juggling. Right. And now it's kind of a, kind of a letdown. So are you seeing that or do you anticipate that? And what are you going to do to mitigate that? That's important to tie that in. And maybe I'll start with, with Hawken. You can comment on that one and others can chime in, please. Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be hard. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think if I can go back and leave myself a voicemail message back to March 15th, you know, and call my <laughs> past self, I would have said, instead of trying to, you know, reschedule patients, I would have been just like, you know, let me take all these hygiene patients and book their six month visit. So that way, you know, we won't worry about getting them back in. And I think, you know, we were so focused, like you were saying about trying to get people back in because they were overdue for recall and things like that, that, you know, we weren't looking forward six months to see, you know, this big gaping hole in the schedule. Um, but I, I, I do agree with you, Joel. I think it's like, we've all been scrambling so much. And, and as much as I think a lot of us are putting on a good face and, you know, we come to work every day and we're giving, you know, a hundred percent, our staff is too. Um, it, it, I, I do find, and I, I just see from a lot of people too, I think they're getting a little bit tired. I mean, it feels like it's been you know, six months of summer, you know, and like, there's been no sort of break in that. And, um, you know, I, 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 as much as I don't want this to end, and I want things to keep 
you know, going and being busy because I like being busy. Um, I think it's going to be a good couple weeks, three weeks, you know, for people to just kind of like maybe slow down a little bit and, and going back to the initial question at the beginning of this entire town hall is looking what stage are we in? You know, are we in that performing stage? Are we in forming, you know, and, and kind of reassess where we're at at this point and reassess our protocols and things like that. Because I feel like a lot of us, because I feel like a lot of us have been flying at the seat of our pants. You know, right. I mean, this is we're kind spinning of a lot crazy. of dishes, like the dishes are spinning in the air. Exactly. We don't want them to come crashing to the ground now. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, we're, we're in that crisis mode. And even though we're sort of, you know, things are going, I mean, really all of us are still in crisis management mode of trying to, you know, because you don't know what might come out next week that may just yeah. cause <laughs> eight dishes to yeah. fall off your plate, you know? And so, yeah. um, right. I, but I, but I, but I do think it's been hard on practitioners as much as maybe we don't want to admit it. I think if we slow down and think about it, it's been really hard on us. Yeah. I was at a kind of corporate event a few years back, you know, and it was kind of a therapy session with the executive team, so to speak. And, but it was a really interesting exercise. They had us draw a little mask out of paper that holes for the eyes and the nose and the mouth. And then the, the leader asked us, the therapist, to draw three words on the outside of the mask, how you want others to see you. And then she said, write three words on the inside of how you really feel. And, you know, so we kind of do wear these masks, all of us mm -hmm. do. It's part of our business right. to do Ooh. that. But I think we have to sometimes look on the inside and say, what is it? And it's a good exercise for everybody. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's something that could be really profound for, for all to do that. So uh, comments from others. Jeff, do you want to comment on this? Yeah. On the um, just, just a couple of practical things I've been thinking through about how can we get ourselves through these next few months because we're shut down for three months and then you know very slow start uh one some insurance companies are allowing people to have two visits inside the calendar year versus every six months so there are people that can come in that may want to come in um, i think hawken alluded to looking at the people that would have been in six months ago we've had a number of people say we just want to wait and so i think communicating yeah. with them hey it's been a year now since you're cleaning and we're safe and and maybe even sending out a video or something, hey, we're safe, this is what we're doing to help people understand, uh, can help. You know, and just digging through your software and just seeing who it is that may need to come in. And I remember right when this started, all, all the people were talking about, oh, shut off your marketing budget, shut off this, shut off that. I think it may be time to begin to do a little bit of marketing and start looking toward a normal uh, once we come out of this, uh, this six month slump and just prepare yourself for the future. I think they're a think good future. Exciting time to be a to be a pediatric dentist. People want to take good care of their kids. Kids don't seem to be getting as sick as as older adults and I think just helping parents understand what we as really uh, you know medical professionals have done and are willing to do to keep them safe and, and to keep them rolling along. And so I think we've great. got a great opportunity if we focus on it in the right way. And I'm going to come back along that positive thinking in a couple of minutes. Hawken? I, I was just going to just uh, go off of what he what Jeff said because the one fear that I've had is is you know do I perpetuate this problem another six months from now and and one of the things that we were doing too is is for those people that are still like you know we're not ready to come in right now we don't want to do it is booking those six month appointments six months out so that mm -hmm. way um you know because by that point everybody's kind of a little bit more like yeah we'll feel good in six months you know from now and so you know, I feel like at least that way, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of building that schedule. So hopefully we don't have the same problem happen six more months from now. Great. And I would yes, add, yes. we are, uh, parents in Arkansas are given the opportunity to go back in the classroom or to do it online at home. And yeah. I don't know, I don't have hard numbers, but when I ask patients, I would say it seems to me probably two thirds want to be back in the classroom. They're kind of done with the at-home schooling. And we've not had big spikes in uh, COVID cases in the schools. There's only one elementary in our area, and our area has almost a half million people in it. Only yeah. one elementary that has had to close down one class so far. Now, the University of Arkansas, right after Rush, that's a hot mess down there, but that's completely different than the population. Universities are totally different, and that's a, yeah. a couple more questions came up about that before. I want to move into our last section here in our remaining minutes, because I want to close with some really positive messages from all of you. Um, but first, one more poll for our audience. 
And that is regarding future town halls. We want to keep doing these. We want to eventually get into some, you know, when we're post COVID, talk about some practice issues and be important to panelists who are working hard just like you are. So we're going to ask you about real quick here, Kelly, if you can put up, uh, what would you like to hear about in future town halls? Just, uh, I think they have to pick one. So if everybody just picks one of these for now, and there may be other subjects, but we just put a list up here. So it's office-based anesthesia, how to get there, non-aerosol generating restorative procedures, update and infection control. We had a lot of infection control questions tonight we weren't able to get to. We're going to have a lot more updates on that, I can assure you, as, as we learn more. There's a lot of good stuff coming out. Marketing your practice. You just mentioned that, Jeff. Uh, parent panel, what are our customers' experiences? Maybe during COVID, maybe they have some advice for us you know, universally, let's talk about that or the many things the APD is doing. Let's hear about the inner workings of the APD. There's a lot going on that maybe people who want to volunteer don't know about and we want to give you some opportunity. So please vote for one of these and I think people have voted and we can, um, yeah. We have, and as soon as we have, uh, Kelly is going to put the answer. Okay, well, the winner is infection control. And, we have a runner up, which is parent panel. Wow, I like that one. Okay, we'll continue to survey you because I learn a lot from what you're seeing. Uh, the reality is what your perceptions are and I think we need to respond to that. So we'll keep, we'll keep going on these and other subjects. There's always an opportunity to give your ideas to us and we're gonna provide you means to do that. So we wanna have topics that are fitting to you. So I, I wanna close with, um, you know, combined question, but really I'll just close with one question, I guess, for our panel, for each of you. We'll go around the room, starting with you, Ron, because you're on my upper left here on the Hollywood Squares. <laughs> the, um, uh, can you give us one positive thing that has come, for, there's more than one positive thing. There are many positive things. I could come up with a long list myself, but I want to hear from each of you. What's a positive thing that's really you're excited about that's come out of this COVID-19 experience? Um, I think I think it's uh, the the big positives that I think it really brought our team together. Uh, we watch each other's back now a, a lot more. We try to remind each other uh, to be safe. Everybody everybody understands that it's important. They've all tried really hard to limit their own exposure outside of the office because um, I, I I I you know when we came back together to get ready to go. I really emphasize the fact that, you know, hey, we really can't survive another shutdown. So, you know, let's all work together. And so, so, and, and, and out of that cohesion, um, we are really impressing a lot of the parents. Uh, we are getting a lot of positive stuff. They can feel people. it, they can palpate it. Right, right. And, and, and you know, and, and the, my, my uh, prevention method happens to be highly visible. Uh, and so, so parents see it. I have hygienists working from other offices, working at other dental offices, saying that they feel safer in my office than their work office. So, um, yeah, I, I'm just thankful that, you know, I had the help when I needed with the grants and the loan packages and things like that, and that allowed me to do that. And, and we now have an opportunity to, to, to do that for other people. No, I think all of you are very positive anyway, as most pediatric dentists are, but it's always nice to hear your messages of encouragement and the, and the learnings that we have. So I'll go to you, Jeff. Yeah, I think for us, um, you know, just, a, a development of deeper compassion among team members for one another and for uh, the patients and what's been going on with them. Um, that's probably been one of, the mo one of the most positive things. We did take the pause as an opportunity to kind of reinvent the wheel and polish what we had. And so that's been a positive thing. And I feel like we've got a, a very exciting united team that's willing to, you know, to, to walk through fire for each other. And that's what you need in something like this. There may be another round of this. And now we know how to respond. We know how to treat each other. We know how to keep each other safe. And, uh, you know, business is going well. We had just opened up a new office right before we were shut down. And everybody's working hard to make that, that work. And it's just been a, great, it's been a great time to be a pediatric dentist and to lead a team of other people. I feel like I want to make a YouTube video. Um, Hawken? Um, 
I mean, I'll echo the sentiment um, that both Ron and um, Jeff said. I think the one silver lining, the one thing that um, for us, I think that will stick is temperature checks. Mm. Um, you know, we've always fought this battle with, you know, kid would come in, mom's like no changes in health history or anything like that. And, you know, they're 10 minutes into their appropriate and the kid like, vomits everywhere and then you know all of a sudden it's like oh yeah he's he was on antibody he's been sick for the last couple of days or things like that um we just push I through it we just push just push through yeah, it yeah yeah i mean you know it's like we don't want to miss our appointment you know um but i think you know it's always been a a, a difficult thing where like you know somebody like a hygienist will say i don't know this kid seems sick to me you know should i do the profi should i not i mean i, I think you know temperature taking temperature readings will probably be something that will stay just like taking a kid's weight and things like that. It applies to us too, it, by the way, that applies, yeah, to it us. applies to us too. Yeah. And I think to just like come in and like have it checked and just have it be a definitive thing that if they're over, you know, 100.4 degrees, like we're going to have to repoint your child rather than having them be in a waiting room, whether it's strep or influenza or what have you. And so, um, you know, that's one thing as a silver lining, like, um, that through this, I hope kind of stays as we move forward in our practices. Great, thank you very much. Anthea and Miles together. <laughs> um, I wanna say that for me personally, one of the best things to come out of this, and I always, I knew this was there, but I saw in action mostly was just relying on my colleagues for support and information. I mean, I felt like, you know, there was so much stuff coming out all at one time and it was like, what do I believe? What's the right thing to do? What's the wrong thing to do? And I was just so thankful and I felt so blessed to have so many like wonderful colleagues to reach out to and so we could collaborate together to figure out what was the best to do for our, our practices, our, our own families and our, and our patients. So to me, that was, like I said, not necessarily a silver lining. It was always there, but it was just became more real in my mind. Yeah. Great. And Jonathan closes yeah, out. Yeah, I'd this say the, the most positive thing is the sense of community um, professionally, as well as, you know, our personal and family um, communities of coming together and supporting and helping each other. Um, you know, throughout this pandemic, there have been a lot of good people that have just sacrificed and, and helped um, through this, these trying times. And I think that's, that's one of the most wonderful things is, is seeing our colleagues stepping up to the plate and, and helping uh, unselfishly on there. Yeah. Wow, you guys were great. I mean, every time I talk to you, we, we've talked many times and um, just getting to hear some more good messages and I expect is gonna continue in this positive way. We're, we're the best specialty we believe. And I think we can prove that with evidence. <laughs> uh, we, we care a lot, not only for our patients, we care about ourselves and now we're talking about our own well-being. And I think this has opened up all kinds of great conversations that perhaps we never would have addressed in the right way. And I think we're, we're gonna be better off because of it. And we're learning how to talk to our, our group and our members. We're learning how to talk to each other, what the, what the information is that we need and what research we need. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us are gonna come advocates for that research. So, so much good is gonna come from this and I can't wait to talk about this, uh, about the educational opportunities. Uh, I'll close with one of my favorites which was, um, you know, I, I speak on certain subjects, uh, medical management of caries and restorative dentistry for children. And, you know, I was getting asked to do lectures when it was shut down for the residency programs. And I think it was Ohio State that organized this big effort to uh, get everybody together. And so whereas not every program has people who have the experience I did in glass ionomers. So they asked me to speak about that. So I had like every resident online together for a course. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I learned from a lot of other venues or things, well, we can never do this, so that could never happen. But things that could never happen, suddenly we were forced to do, and they're going to stick, and they're really for our benefit. There are so many good things about working together that, that make us all better. So thank you so much to each of your, our panelists tonight. Thank you to our sponsor, De Novo, And thank you to the staff of APD who helped all of us put this together. And thank you to our audience for listening and giving us your insight. And we hope to see you, all of you, again next time. So take care. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. You guys. <laughs>